What's up? Time Talks Med here. In this video, we're going to talk about the parasympathetic nervous system. As you see from this brief diagram, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic parts of our nervous system controls more or less all of our internal organs. Sympathetic being the fight or flight response, and parasympathetic being the rest and digest response. And they're both, as you see here, a part of our autonomic nervous system, which again is the motor division of our peripheral nervous system. I did make an introductory video about the peripheral nervous system, so if you guys have absolutely no clue what the peripheral nervous system is, I urge you guys to watch that one first. But all in all, I will try to simplify the parasympathetic nervous system as much as I can, so that it will make sense at a detailed level, uh, within the aspect of anatomy and physiology at least. So in this video, we're going detailed into the parasympathetic nervous system. And we're going to do that by first going through the general structures and terms associated with the parasympathetic aspect of the autonomic nervous system. Basically talk a little bit about ganglia, the pre and post synaptic neurons and their neurotransmitters. And basically how the parasympathetic nervous system is built in general. Then we're going to talk about the cranial outflow and go through the pathway of the cranial nerves involved and what structures they innervate. And then run through the sacral outflow where it originates from and basically what it innervates and its functions. So let's go ahead and start with some terms. The autonomic nervous system, so both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, is made up of a relay that includes two neurons. And when there's a group of nerve cell bodies that are next to each other within the actual central nervous system, the whole thing is called a nucleus while a group of nerve cell bodies that are located outside of the central nervous system is called a ganglion. This is a very, very important thing to remember. Now, the autonomic nervous system has an effect on all the areas of the body. The sympathetic outflow is primarily from the thoracolumbar area, right? Those are the preganglionic cholinergic fibers that go from the spinal cord towards either the paravertebral ganglia or the prevertebral ganglia from where postganglionic, primarily adrenergic neurons are going to go out from. The parasympathetic nervous system has their preganglionic fibers coming from the brainstem, which travels towards a peripherally located ganglion, as well as from the sacral region, going towards a parasympathetic ganglion that lie either near the organ or within the actual organ they innervate, and then they give off postganglionic cholinergic neurons. Now, there are three main categories that we can see a clear difference between these two systems. And we already know a little bit about the sympathetic nervous system since we covered it in our last video. But in terms of tertiary, you know, the sympathetic nervous system is going to innervate all areas of the body, primarily because the suprarenal gland is going to spit a lot of epinephrine and norepinephrine within the blood parasympathetic nervous system is primarily localized to the innervated areas. So the distribution is focused on the head, the body cavities and the external genitalia. So the limbs don't receive parasympathetic innervation, for example, neither the body walls. Now in terms of activity, when you activate the sympathetic nervous system, you will get a more generalized and indirect effect. This is because, for one thing, you will have a large amount of catecholamines circulating in the blood. And another reason is because the ratio between the pre- and post ganglionic fibers are approximately 1 to 15 or more. So 15 or more post ganglionic fibers are activated just from one pre ganglionic fiber. If the parasympathetic is stimulated, the ratio here is approximately one pre ganglionic fiber to two postganglionic fibers. So you'll get a more specific and indirect response. And functions, again, sympathetic is more associated with increased level of activity and assisting in coping with stress and physical exertion. Parasympathetic is associated with things like relaxation, homeostasis, restoration, and so on. Now, I will go through the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system to each specific organ later in this video, but as you see from just the functional area, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions often function as antagonistic systems, and that is, they produce activities in opposition to one another. 
So for example, sympathetic activity increases the heart rate, causes bronchodilation, decreases the peristalsis in the gut tube, closing the sphincters, relaxation of the general bladder wall, and dilation of the pupils, while the parasympathetic activity results in decelerated heart rate, bronchoconstriction, increased gut peristalsis, opening the sphincters, contraction of the bladder wall, and constriction of the pupils. However, not always are they antagonistic, and this is a very important point to, to understand. So the two divisions may also be complementary to one another, and they can also work as synergistic systems. So for example, in normal sexual function in males, parasympathetic activity produces erection, and sympathetic activity results in ejaculation. So here, these two systems complement each other. Another thing is that one division may function independently of the other. So for example, sympathetic stimulation activates sweat gland secretion, but parasympathetic play absolutely no role in sweat gland activity. All right, now lastly, before we go on and talk about the actual outflow of the system, let's quickly just go through how all of this function. So first we have a preganglionic neuron located within the brainstem or the sacral spinal cord. These preganglionic neurons release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which binds to nicotinic receptors on the cell membrane of postganglionic neuron cell bodies. Nicotinic receptors are ion channels that open when acetylcholine binds to them, and they allow positive ions like sodium and potassium to cross the cell membrane, activating the postganglionic neurons. Postganglionic neurons are also called cholinergic neurons because just like the preganglionic neurons, they also release acetylcholine. This time, however, the acetylcholine binds to the muscarinic receptors on the cells of the target organ. So, muscarinic receptors, they are G-protein coupled receptors, as you see here, meaning that when acetylcholine binds, they activate the G-protein to ultimately enable the cell to change in a number of ways. And that's how the parasympathetic nervous system creates a change at a cellular level. So sympathetic has adrenergic postganglionic neurons primarily, parasympathetic has cholinergic postganglionic neurons. Awesome. So here we see the mesencephalon, pons, and the spinal cord. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system is primarily going to be something called craniosacral outflow. Those in the brain, the cranial part, primarily come from specific parasympathetic nuclei located within the brainstem of certain cranial nerves. Those are the oculomotor nerve, facial nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, and the vagus nerve. The sacral outflow, or the sacral part of the preganglionic neurons, originate in the lateral gray matter of the second, third, and fourth sacral segments of the spinal cord. However, because the number of cells here are insufficient to form a distinct bulge, such as seen in the thoracolumbar region, you will rarely see a lateral gray horn. So if you look at the cross-section of the sacral spinal cord within the microscope, you might see that the lateral horn might be absent sometimes. Now, the myelinated axons leave the spinal cord in the anterior nerve root of the corresponding spinal nerve, then leave the S2 to S4 spinal nerves and form the pelvic splanctic nerves. Now, because of this level of origin and departure from the central nervous system, we call these parasympathetic divisions a what? We refer to it as craniosacral outflow. Now, let's start with the most proximal nerve of the cranial outflow. The oculomotor nerve's parasympathetic nucleus is located within the mesencephalon, specifically at the level of the superior colliculus. Just to refresh your memory, I'm not going to talk about all of this in detail because we already covered the cranial nerves in the previous videos, but here we see the posterior view of the mesencephalon. If we cut the mesencephalon at the level of the superior colliculus and then look at the cross section, you will see this. So we can see the superior colliculi, the cerebral peduncles, the interpeduncular space, and the aqueduct of the midbrain, which connects the fourth ventricle to the third ventricle. Within the midbrain, we can find the superior colliculi, we can see the periaqueductal gray matter, the reticular formation, the red nuclei, which take in impulses from the brain and the cerebellum, and give off the rubrospinal tract for muscle coordination. At this level, we can also find the nucleus of the oculomotor nerve, 
which will give off fibers traveling towards the anterior side and leave through the sulcus of the oculomotor nerve on the anterior side of the midbrain. The oculomotor nerve is a nerve that consists of somatic fibers and preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. The somatic fibers are fibers you see here coming from the nucleus of the oculomotor nerve which supplies the extrinsic muscles of the eyeball. The parasympathetic portion of the oculomotor nerve comes from the accessory nucleus of the oculomotor nerve which is also called the Edinger-Westphal nucleus and they give off parasympathetic fibers that go together with the oculomotor nerve forming a oculomotor nerve complex and this is the nucleus I'm talking about here. So this nucleus will give off preganglionic parasympathetic fibers that will travel through the cavernous sinus, go through the superior orbital fissure and the common tendons ring to synapse with a postganglionic neuron within the ciliary ganglion, from where postganglionic parasympathetic fibers will go as short ciliary nerves towards the ciliaris muscle. The ciliaris muscle is then going to contract and when it contracts, the zonular fibers get relaxed, which allows the lens to become more globular-like. And when the lens becomes globular, it helps with near vision. So this is an accommodation response, helps with near vision. Now, the other muscle that it goes to is called the sphincter pupillae. And when the sphincter pupillae contracts, it squeezes the pupil hole and makes it really small. So it causes pupillary constriction. And when you constrict the pupils, it allows less light rays to come into the eye, which also have an effect of near vision. So that's it. That's the oculomotor nerve. Next one is the facial nerve. The facial nerve has several nuclei that give off fibers that travel within the actual nerve. But one of the nuclei is called the superior salivatory nucleus, which give off preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. These fibers are going to leave go through the internal acoustic meatus and give off an important nerve called the greater petrosal nerve. This nerve will synapse with the pterygopalatine ganglion and then after that the postganglionic fibers will go innervate several glands. Specifically the lacrimal gland can be glands in the nasal cavity, sinuses and the palate. So it's going to innervate these glands releasing acetylcholine, which will stimulate these cells to start increasing the production of these watery secretions. For example, you will have more tear production, nasal secretion, palatine secretion, and so on. It's also going to give off corda tympani, which will synapse with the postganglionic neurons in the submandibular ganglion, and these postganglionic fibers will innervate the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands and it will stimulate them into secreting more saliva along with digestive enzymes as well, like the salivary amylase. So that's it for that one. Now let's do the glossopharyngeal. The glossopharyngeal nerve has its parasympathetic origin within the inferior salivatory nucleus, which give off preganglionic parasympathetic fibers that go through the jugular foramen. Then remember, they travel through the tympanic nerve, through this tympanic plexus, and ultimately leave as a lesser petrosal nerve, which will finally end up in the otic ganglion. The otic ganglion will then give off postganglionic parasympathetic fibers to the last salivary glands, one of the big ones. Which one's that? It's the parotid gland. And it's going to stimulate the parotid salivary gland to start increasing its secretions. So lots of watery secretions and salivary amylase. All in order to lubricate our food, and digest it a little bit chemically as well through the amylase. So that was this one. The last one is the biggest one, the vagus nerve. And this one has the posterior nucleus of the vagus nerve, providing parasympathetic innervation to the majority of the organs within us. I'm not going to go in detail into each and every branch, but I'm going to keep it very simple and say that it's going to leave the cranium through the jugular foramen. Then it will give off a few fibers towards the upper respiratory tract, the larynx and the trachea, to basically release acetylcholine to increase the mucus secretions and cause a little bit of contraction of the smooth muscles to constrict the airways. Remember, airway smooth muscles are extended from the trachea throughout the bronchial tree, so it increases in number the further distally you get in the airways. And right now, we're activating the parasympathetic nervous system. You're resting. You don't really need all the air in. 
and you want to produce more mucus to humidify the air and help with the protection of certain particles and foreign organisms as a way to protect the airways so you're producing more uh, mucus so that is what's primarily going to happen here then we got some branches for the cardiac plexus now we have to be very careful because the parasympathetic nervous system doesn't really affect the cardiac muscle cells so much like the sympathetic nervous system do the parasympathetic nervous system is primarily going to affect the conducting system, nodal cells, so the SA node and the AV node. You're resting, you want to decrease the heart rate, so it has a negative chronotropic and dromotropic action. The vagus nerve is going to contribute to the pulmonary plexus, causing bronchoconstriction, and a little bit of increased mucus secretion as well, right? Same as what it did in the upper respiratory tract. Then the nerve is going to continue along the esophagus and form the esophageal plexus. Now, when you're resting and digesting, what do you want the GI tract to do? To increase motility. So it primarily increases the peristalsis. Now, the vagus nerve is going to continue along the esophagus and then through the diaphragmatic hiatus and then split into the left and the right vagus nerve, going anterior and posterior to the stomach. The left one will give off a nerve towards the liver and the biliary tree, going within the hepatic plexus, basically helping the liver to be able to stimulate glycogenesis, storing the glucose. Remember, when you're resting and digesting, you want to digest, so it also helps with the contraction of the gallbladder, to a little degree, but the anterior vagal trunk primarily stimulate the liver. The stomach is also going to be innervated to increase in motility and increase in gastric secretion. Now, one of the major branches of this nerve are the celiac branches, going towards many different plexuses within the abdominal cavity, primarily the celiac plexus, but it can also go to the splenic plexus, hepatic plexus, renal plexus, suprarenal plexus, and the superior mesenteric plexus. The inferior mesenteric plexus is more of the sacral outflow, but it's going to basically help innervate a lot of different organs within us to help with the rest and digest state like increase in urine production, increase in motility and secretion and absorption from the GI tract, stimulate the pancreas in the exocrine and the endocrine secretion, like releasing insulin. When it comes to the large intestine, however, it really only innervates the proximal parts up until the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. The rest is being innervated by the sacral outflow. Alright, what else? From the actual posterior vagal trunk, you may have branches that go to the hepatic plexus directly or branches that go towards the renal plexus directly. So that was mainly the cranial outflow. Let's now quickly do the sacral outflow. The sacral preganglionic neurons originate from the segments S2, S3 and S4. These axons leave the spinal cord in the anterior nerve roots of the corresponding spinal nerve, then leave the S2 to S4 spinal nerves and form the pelvic splanctic nerves. The pelvic splanctic nerves will run into the inferior hypogastric plexus and then innervate the descending colon, remaining transverse colon, sigmoid colon and the rectum, increasing uh, the motility, increasing the secretion and increasing the absorption. Also controlling the internal anal sphincter, which relaxes to offer the feces to move forward when the rectum is full. And if you don't have time for that at the moment, you contract the external anal sphincter consciously to prevent the poop from exiting at that moment. It's also going to innervate the bladder wall to cause bladder wall contraction and internal urethral sphincter relaxation to basically help you urinate. And lastly, it's going to innervate the male and female genitals. For male reproductive system, remember it's going to engorge the penis with blood, helping with erection by basically releasing acetylcholine to stimulate the cavernous endothelial cells to produce nitric oxide, which is going to act on the corpora cavernosa, causing smooth muscle cell relaxation, vasodilation and erection. For female, it's going to increase the blood flow to the clitoris, engorging the clitoris with blood. So that was everything I had for the parasympathetic nervous system. And we now covered both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system in the last two videos. Thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. If you enjoyed, learned something from it, please remember to like, comment your favorite moment, subscribe, turn on those notifications. If you're looking for other ways to support, go ahead and check out the link in the description box. Have fun y'all. Peace.